Weapons, a pretty important addition to the Terraria universe. So what if we set ourselves the task of beating the game, only using the worst this world has to offer? But Sock, how are you possibly going to judge what's good or bad? Ah, well, I did think long and hard about engineering a complex system to weight a weapon's ability on our score. Luckily, tiermaker.com kind of did that work already, with it giving us a 72 cumulative average tier list of a majority of Terraria's weapons. So, with F tier alone looking physically impossible, I figured it was only fair to draw the line at D tier and below, giving us quite the interesting pool to play with. So without further ado, let's jump into it. Oh, and I've heard there's like a subscribe thing as well. Anyway, jumping into our brand new luscious world, things were pretty typical to start, with our copper tools definitely not being remarkable enough to ditch already. So with an early construction of the Leaning Tower of NPCs underway, and a very premature slime death, <laughs> well that's the first death. I really wanted to get out there and get inspired, and that's just what this guide to plant fibre didn't do. So it was about time we went underground. And goddamn, this place was littered with wooden chests, which just like that, actually gave us our first additional legal weapon of the run, a beautiful wooden boomerang. I was just so overjoyed I had to jump to my death. That water was right. This was just the beginning though, because with our new OP weapon in hand, and a few more underground goodies obtained, including the best statue in the game, this lucky jungle chest find suddenly gave me the inspiration I was deeply craving. Fish. Fish, fish, purple fish. <gasps> yes, the purple club fish. This thing was not only legal, but also an absolute beast. So it's safe to say this was now our mission. And with his well-timed magic mirror looting getting us back on the surface, I spared no time at all finding our corruption. But I mean, that's really where the winds kind of end, because setting this up was an absolute pain in the backside. No! I mean seriously, not only was the biggest pool I could find smaller than my bathtub, but the 40 or so fishing power I had really wasn't anything remarkable. I literally even got a damn Jojo Cola from it. So, with a few trips to the demolitionist and back, I expanded the tub to be a more reasonable size. And well, did that ever do the trick? This is the most fishing I've ever done in Terraria history, by the way. Oh! The luxury of having a D tier Terraria weapon was no joke, with it increasing my survivability against these jungle slimes by at least 0.2 milliseconds. But don't worry, because with the blessing of a few more chests coming my way, we finally had a reasonable amount of defense and mobility. It's a shame this guy had to show up and remind us how weak we are, though. No. So with this new humiliation to overcome, I need to get a hell of a lot more tanky, especially if I'm going to be using trash weapons. Also, with a massive vein of diamonds just happening to fall in my arms, as the staff was out of the question completely, now was a better time than ever to flex the best kind of hook. So what are we going to do next? Well, after some subtle deforestation, there was one ultimate weapon I suddenly had on my radar. All I can say is, it requires one certain Italian boy to move in. So with that cooking in the background, I urgently needed to think about my Eye of Cthulhu kill, which when you can't even use something as simple as a platinum bow, requires us to think outside the box a little. Ah, and with us heading to our underground ice biome, I give you three guesses what that is. Before that though, as usual, I did get slightly sidetracked, checking out our dungeon on the left side of the map for the first time. And despite this what in a, I don't know, surface dungeon chest spectacle, there really wasn't much else that, wait a minute, yeah, two rare spectacles apparently, with this floating island being accessible with just a bit of rope. Unfortunately no wings for us though. Okay, back on track with the task in hand, and if you hadn't guessed already, it's Frost Dagger Fish. Now, as we'd already lost 72% of our brain cells fishing in the corruption earlier, Frost me now? <laughs> Wait, frost me now? This was just a baby play, with the dagger vision question not being too hard to come by, and probably due to the quality of the pool, I even managed to nab a gold crepe, giving us our first of amount. And with this, we're basically ready for the fight. Just had a few more things to do first though, like getting the first few pieces of jungle armor, which was fun, and quickly murdering the painter in the most inefficient way possible for a chance at the paintball gun. No cigar this time though. Also, did I just get minecrafted to death? Who cares though, because it was time to summon the Eye of Cthulhu. And man, I've said it before and I'll say it again, Frost Daggerfish are where it's at. Like seriously, the fact the majority voted these as a D tier weapon blows my mind. But thank god they did, because just like that, our first boss is down. 
Right then, what next, you ask? Well, aside from the continuous murder of our painter being the main plan for a much needed weapon upgrade, I did have a massive plan B simmering in the back of my mind, and with the eater of worlds just around the corner, it was about time to execute it. And to be brutally honest here, this is a weapon I have never used before in my life, and with them being snugly placed at the top of D tier, it was about time I tried them out. And I mean, if you haven't guessed it already from the average daily alcohol intake of a Scotsman I was brewing, I'll help you out. Molotovs, and particularly the cocktail variant. These alone, apparently, should be more than enough to take down the Eater of Worlds on expert mode. So with the usual arena preparations made, and a horrible navigational route back to the surface set, it's going to be a multi-stage process. It was time for the moment of truth. And well, uh, I can kind of see where they get their DTR rating from, as although the function of these throwables were perfect for this multi-segment boss, its damage was pretty trash, with me coming proper close to death on multiple occasions. Regardless though, let's go and a meteorite, yes! While not our fastest eater of world skill in the world, that's a weird sentence, we're one step closer to the wall in red. So, where do we go now? Well, with some delightful armor upgrades made, and our tower of reasonably priced rent extended, I wanted to get the dungeon done and dusted nice and quick, as there rests one weapon I've had my eye on since the beginning. Before that though, the legend and his Mario was finally kind enough to reward his continuous sacrifice with the legendary paintball gun, which for those of you who haven't seen, although it was only voted as D tier, nearly matches the mini shark in damage and has infinite ammo. There was one problem though, this is definitely a case of too little, far too late, because while I could, I did not want to defeat Skeletron with this thing at all. So while building the arena for the fight, I had a big old think, and my god, imagine if this weapon right here was somehow under C tier on the list. Well, that's that sorted. And with its crafting recipe being equally too good to be true, I started to have second doubts on just how impactful its main compromise was gonna be. Sand isn't that bad, is it? So, with some big brain torch prep in place, wait, thousand IQ moment, thousand IQ moment, see, to catch the sand, we were almost ready for our first fabled attempt, just had to run some errands first. Alright, it was actually time, and with us off to a less than ideal start, I began noticing a problem very quickly. And no, it's not my substantial skill issue during this fight, but was the fact my genius sand deflection tactic wasn't working anymore, which would you believe it, makes this fight a living hell. But still, for all the sand and less ideal mobility, I persevered through the pain. Unfortunately though, to a very quick demise. No, dude. <laughs> Man, that was just terrible. But you know, I really don't think that was actually the fault of the sand gun. Well, aside from the utter mess it made, but it was more so my still primitive mobility. Which is why seeing this pop up moments after returning home was actually a massive blessing, because it obviously meant we had a chance of obtaining the epic harpoon. That, that's a joke, because it actually meant the possibility of a goblin tinkerer, which of course opens up a plethora of better mobility options. So, after defeating the army full of goblins, I headed straight on the ground looking for the conman himself. Oh, that's the wrong one. And after a bit of a mix up, we found the little fella. This was big, as not only it meant insane accessory upgrades, which we desperately, desperately needed, but also a way to waste all our hard-earned money on reforges. Or are we? Because miraculously, I used up all my luck for the rest of the year, getting warding on both these items. What can I say? So with me now raring to go, it was time for take two. And yeah, what a difference being able to move more than three feet off the ground actually makes, with this being actually one of the chilliest Skeletron fights I've had in a very long time. Of course though, any longer in the sand may have come unbearable, but honestly, it really wasn't that bad, so thank you everyone who voted this weapon so low. Now then, this is a whopping moment for us, as the dungeon genuinely offers the highest ranked weapon possible in this entire challenge playthrough, which really goes to show just how crippling Hartman's gonna be. Yes, the one and only handgun. With this being gold chest loot, this also gave me a great opportunity to get a cobalt shield, which is just nice to have. When it comes to other weapons though, this part was quite painful, as other than the handgun and Muramasa, everything else was straight in the bin. 
And to be honest, at this point was when I began to become a little worried about the Wall of Flesh fight, as I wasn't quite sure just how inferior the regular handgun was to the usually used Phoenix Blaster. I'm sure I'll find out pretty soon though, because in the meantime, we needed to get to hell. Once we arrived, we had the usual bits and bobs to sort out, like for instance, how long would I need my Hellbridge to actually be? Well, before getting ahead of ourselves here, apart from the odd crippling realisation that I couldn't use a single god tier shadow chest weapon, and us bumping into just a random unconscious bloke at the bottom of the underworld, it was about time we got ourselves our well-deserved Hellstone upgrades. A lovely. Okay, things are getting pretty real now, which is precisely why I suddenly remembered something I completely glossed over earlier in the playthrough. Our meteorite, which although it does sound particularly useful on a trash weapons only playthrough, thanks to the phase blades, wasn't why I was so excited, but was the fact of meteor shots. These things single handedly in my mind makes the handgun go from a high D to a high C, with its projectiles now being able to pierce for a single enemy. And this may not sound like much, but I promise you, this will certainly make all the difference when fighting the wall. So, I guess we really only had one more thing left to do, yeah, with a new keyboard first. It was almost time to fight the wall. As always though, let me just real quick grab the last remaining life crystals we need, because it was time for the big moment. Uh, I, I said it was time for the big moment. Okay, good. Hang on, let's Molotov. Does Molotovs do anything at this stage? The answer to that question is a not really, which was not good news for the rest of this fight, because although my handgun could pierce a bit, it wasn't making nearly enough contact with the eyes for good damage. And as you would expect, things only got a lot more intense from here, with the wall not only speeding up rapidly, but my definitely long enough hellbridge completely running out, leading the fight into no man's land. Yeah, this wasn't ideal, but I still had faith, because the damage was little but consistent. All I'd need to do is keep on the pressure before we reach the side of our small well. Oh, this was a close one. And ha, that's all you're getting today, folks. Sorry. <laughs> if you want to see a part two of this series, because let me tell you, hard mode is genuinely insane, why not drop a like and subscribe? This has been Zuck with Tease, and I'll see you in the next one.